at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He teaches graduate and undergraduate courses emphasizing earth science, climate change on Pacific islands, and coastal geology. And he's been the principal advisor in the awarding of over 20 graduate degrees there. In 2011, Chip was awarded the University of Hawaii Chancellor's Citation for Meritorious Teaching, which was his second. And he was recognized in 2011 by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency with an Environmental Achievement Award in Climate Change Science. Chip has over 100 scientific publications to his record and recently has published three books. Chip, you've been very busy, I noticed, in the last few years as I look at these since 2011. The first was Living on the Shores of Hawaii, Natural Hazards, the Environment, and Our Communities. Chip has also written Physical Geology, the Science of Earth, which I have a feeling your students get a chance to read. That's right, it's a textbook. Okay. And the third, Climate Change, What the Science Tells Us, which Chip published in 2013. For his work and service to government agencies and public groups, he was the 2006 recipient of the Hun, Wo, and Elizabeth Lau Cheng Foundation Award for faculty service to the community given by the University of Hawaii Board of Regents. Uh, he has also received the Robert W. Quantum Award for Distinguished Community Service. So, even though we have you on Citrix, Chip, we are thrilled you're here, and thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everybody. So what I'm going to do is oh, uh, ask you to respond to the first question I sent you in advance, and I'll read it for the room. And then we're going to allow the commissioners and those in the public to have a chance to speak with you for the few minutes that we have, OK? Yep. So the question is, for those of us who know a little bit about your history, a while back, you made a shift in your point of view about the cause of our global temperature change from the opinion that it was a natural cyclical change to one that was indeed man-made climate change. Could you take us through the process of what you've learned over the years that has caused you to make that major shift in your point of view and anything that you think is relevant to us in relation to that? Sure. Um and I'll try to keep this short. I've been teaching uh, paleoclimate, which is the study of past climates, uh, for the better part of 20 years. And it's well known that climate has been changing from warm periods to ice ages and back to warm periods again uh, because of certain variations in Earth's orbit around the sun. Earth's axis uh, changes its tilt, which uh, influences how much sunlight reaches uh, the Arctic region, which determines where we're going to grow glaciers, which will drive us into an ice age. And then uh, as the tilt of Earth's axis changes again, and also as Earth's orbit around the sun changes, so that during some seasons we might be further away from the sun or closer to the sun, along with changes in the tilt, all of these uh, lead to ice ages that form roughly every 100,000 years separated by warm intervals known as interglacials. And we currently live in an interglacial. It's known as the Holocene, which means recent time. And it started roughly 10,000 years ago. And it's during this current warm period that human society has arisen. We've domesticated animals. We've learned how to grow food rather than hunter-gatherer societies. And so my initial reaction to global climate change was not to disbelieve it, but that we had not fully understood the role of natural climate cycles um, in potentially driving some or all of the warming um, that we were observing. I've always uh, believed that the data that was collected by researchers and especially the government agencies like NASA and NOAA uh, showing the warming atmosphere was very good data, but um, up till maybe, I can't remember uh, when we had that conversation, Sharon, but maybe it was uh, five to ten years ago, I had thought that the natural climate system had not been fully understood. Um, however, I, in keeping track of the literature, I now know that natural climate cycles are not responsible for the current warming. The warming is occurring far too fast, 
Uh, it is driving the surface temperature of the planet and the temperature of the oceans uh, much faster than uh, and at higher magnitude than um, any natural climate cycle that we have seen um, would be able to. And I'll take any questions. Uh, I don't want to just drone on and on. I'm trying to keep it short and conversational. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, please fire them at me. Chip, I'm going to throw one more at you that uh, I think is uh, on the lines of others in the room. Uh, you live in an area where there's water all around you. We live in a little town that is pretty much surrounded by water as well. So I'm wondering, in your everything you've done, everything you know, and everything you're doing for the state of Hawaii to help prepare it for sea rise. If, any thoughts you have for us as a relatively small town that probably shares the same concerns and perhaps could be taking some initiative that we haven't thought about? Sure, absolutely. And I'll expand um, beyond just the issue of sea level rise. So two years ago, the Hawaii State Legislature uh, mandated the creation of an interagency climate adaptation committee. And um, they asked the State Department of Land and Natural Resources and the State Office of Planning to co-chair this committee. And on the committee is a representative of every state and county agency um, that has any interest in climate change. And basically, that's, that's every state and county agency. Um, the committee uh, did not meet in its first year because we had a new governor elected and we were waiting to see if the new governor was going to support the formation and continuation of the committee. And indeed he has. So the first meeting of the Climate Adaptation Committee was in June. The second meeting is tomorrow afternoon. And the committee chose sea level rise as its first issue. Um, this committee is going to stand in perpetuity. So after they deal with sea level rise, they're going to move on to some other climate issues, such as perhaps heat waves, um, changes in precipitation, et cetera, et cetera. The um, work in identifying areas in our community that are vulnerable to sea level rise has fallen to my research group at the University of Hawaii. And we are looking at how coastal erosion is going to change with sea level rise over the next century, how waves are going to um, inundate our communities with greater and greater frequency with sea level rise, how the groundwater table is going to rise because in the coastal zone, the water table is connected to the ocean. And so you get a thing known as groundwater inundation, which is flooding by the water table rising through the ground basically making new wetlands where before you would have dry ground. Um, and then also what's known as passive inundation, and that's where salt water comes up through your storm drains. It comes up onto the streets, floods the gutters of the street, and floods streets. So we're modeling all of these different physical processes related to sea level rise for the islands of Maui, Kauai, and Oahu. We expect our modeling to be finished in the next two years, two and a half years. And the committee has hired a consulting firm called TetraTech, which is an international consulting company. I'm sure you guys have an office nearby there of TetraTech. And TetraTech is reviewing all the other sea level adaptation reports from other states and other nations, in fact, um, and is applying a geographic information system that's available from FEMA known as HAZUS, and HAZUS has uh, census data, uh, lot value data, buried infrastructure, roads and highways. It has all the economic footprint, schools, hospitals, all the economic footprint of every community in, in um, the nation. And so we're producing map layers that show different types of sea level rise inundation, and they're going to count the uh, economic exposure of our community uh, to these different physical processes related to sea level rise. And the entire uh, effort is going to result three years from now in a report 
uh, suggesting different ways to that the community of Hawaii can adapt to sea level rise, suggesting new legislation for the capital uh, to consider, and uh, other other consequences, other outcomes of uh, studying this issue in a very detailed manner. And so, with regard to sea level rise, um, I've looked at a website that NOAA maintains called the Sea Level Rise Viewer, or SLR Viewer. And Benicia looks like uh, your coastal zone under two to four feet of sea level rise, which is uh, the best science is, is likely to occur later on in the second half of this century. Um, everything in your coastal region looks like it's vulnerable or going to be exposed to some of these hazards of, of sea level rise. And I'll, I'll stop my description there, but it, there's also information on heat waves and uh, precipitation that, that might be worth discussing as well. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, Chair Carriage. Yeah, I'd like commissioner. And the, the meeting over to others that can see you that you can't see. Okay. Okay. Ted, do any of the uh, commissioners have a question? Any questions? I have a question. Uh, yes, Commissioner Lindsay. My question. Sure, and I can also only hear you. Okay. All okay. right. All right. I'll wait until so my question is in regards to uh, short-lived uh, greenhouse gases. Besides, it's been like change in the science. I know we, you know, mainly we focus on CO2, but you know, methane and nitrous oxide we also track. And I know there are other short-lived uh, climate change uh, agents. And has there been change in science that would um, direct us towards doing more monitoring of these other short-lived? Uh, greenhouse gas or greenhouse safe for like particular matter like carbon something like that I don't know. Okay. <laughs> that safe. it's a long question <laughs> uh, so chip one of the commissioners David would like to know in all the science that's been done in the last several years is there any reason for us to be monitoring some of the other greenhouse gas emitters such as Alternate carbons or? I believe uh, ozone is also a short lived. Uh, and ozone is a short lived one, for example. Besides methane, you know, methane and nitrous oxide, I know we track those, but okay. I think there's some other ones. So like, David's saying he knows we track methane and nitrous oxide. Are there others in your view that are worth monitoring? Yeah, I think there's some other ones. So David's saying he knows we track methane and nitrous oxide. Are there others in your view that we should be tracking that we're not? When you say we, do you mean the city of Benicia or do you mean the nation? Those things that should rise to the level of into our climate action plan. I mean, say amend our climate action plan to look at these, some you know, to, to focus on some of these short lived. Okay. So, Jeff, David's thought is locally as well as more broadly, and should we be looking at them as part of our local climate action plan and initiating the concern and the interest in bringing this to the surface and looking at it? I'm going to assume that your city budget, like many city budgets, is uh, is not as robust as you would like it to be. And given that, I think the best way for you to spend your energy and money is on adapting to climate change and leave the monitoring of greenhouse gases and the mitigation to federal and state agencies. Local communities, I think, should begin to prepare themselves. And you guys, I'm sure, have been working hard on water issues uh, related to the drought. But um, heat waves are gonna require some attention from you as well. And your, wherever you get your drinking water, I, I assume that uh, you're already plugged into your aquifer system and monitoring your aquifer, looking at potential leaks in your water delivery, um, paying attention to stormwater runoff. You know, there's drinking water that falls out of the sky and to just let it run off into the ocean uh, would be a mistake. We need to catch that water 
And um, do you have a stormwater runoff taxation district, for instance? It's very common for local communities to have a taxation district and that money gets applied towards catching the drinking water that falls out of the sky and not letting it just run off. So I'm sorry to divert your question, but um, I, I think that planning for adaptation to sea level rise, heat waves, uh, changes in storminess, um, changes in precipitation, et cetera, et cetera, um, that's probably the best use of limited resources and limited human energy. And then you get blackouts and brownouts, and for buildings that have several floors, the elevator system stops working. And the elderly and the young who are not capable of taking the stairs end up um, suffering in their, uh, in their overheating apartments. The, uh, you know, the attempt to call for help to the police, to the fire department, means that those rescue uh, first responders are overwhelmed with literally thousands of calls for help. And they may not get to you for days. And um, this is how thousands and thousands of people can die in the heat wave. So you need to armor your electrical grid for intense demand during heat waves. You need to have your emergency responders think about how are they going to handle a flood of calls in a very short period of time? What's the most efficient way to handle that? Are they going to make use of volunteers to suddenly beef up their forces? Um, you also need about future need to think about future building codes. How can you build not only individual homes and commercial businesses, but also high rises, so that they can adapt to heat waves, so that they can adapt to um, uh, the possibility of blackouts and brownouts? The city of Los Angeles just passed an ordinance requiring that all rooftops are cool rooftops. So cool rooftops require that they are either painted white or that they have gardens on uh, the surface. Um, there's a lot of technical detail uh, with regard to how you cool down the urban heat island effect in the city with all that pavement, all that, uh, all that pavement tends to heat up. Um, I could go on and on, uh, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sit here and give you guys a lecture. But hopefully, you've seen that heat waves have, uh, you know, an engineering component. They have an emergency responder component, a hospital component, a electricity grid component, and this applies the same sort of um, multifaceted uh, component detail applies to storms, precipitation, drinking water, sea level rise. Uh, drought, etc., etc., etc. So there's a lot to look into, and uh, the city would would probably benefit by bringing in some sort of expert who understands all this, and ask them if they will volunteer their time. Maybe there's someone in your community that will volunteer their time, and try to avoid the typical consultant that's going to charge you an outrageous sum of money to do something that really just some some smart members or informed members of your community could probably do for you anyway. Actually, we have, we are do, working on a climate, climate adaptation plan uh, right now, so Good. We're, we're sort of sort of there already. Uh, Great. So our time is, uh, or at least we're approaching that point. We're, we're going to be examining it this fall. So I think our, our time is up. I wanted to thank you very much for your time, and uh, this has been uh, very interesting, and uh, I think can can help our commission look at you know what we should be doing in the future. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Good luck. Thanks very much, Chip. Really appreciate it. Yeah.